Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you so much, Lord, for your word, your word which truly gives us hope, truly gives us peace, and truly gives us the promises of God by which we can look forward with optimism uh, in the midst of a world that seems to have no vision. So bless us tonight, Lord, once again, as we look in your word, and I just pray that you'll touch everyone uh, as we consider another component, not just of scripture, but of your thoughts toward us, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. H have you ever had a song get stuck in your head? It could be a good song or it could be a bad song. Just, you know, you, you, you listen to it and, or you can hear it in your mind, and then it's just next thing you know, you're still thinking about it an hour later, and eventually it gets really frustrating because you can't get it out of your head. Have you ever had that experience? Me too. Uh, there's a song that really, really bothers me. And, and see, even just talking about it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get into my, into my head. But you know what? It's okay. Now, some of you may like the song, but let me explain why I do not like the song. The song I do not like, which really bothers me, is a song called From a Distance. Okay? Very famous song, and I'm sure you, you have heard it before. God is Watching from a Distance. Okay? Anybody heard that song? Okay. I'll explain why the song bothers me so much. I'm going to read just one stanza from the song, and, uh, and then I'll explain. The song says this, from a distance, we all have enough, and no one is in need, and there are no guns, no bombs, and no disease, no hungry mouths to feed. From a distance, we are instruments marching in a common band, playing songs of hope, playing songs of peace. They are the songs of every man. God is watching from a distance. Now, those lyrics in and of themselves may seem like nice lyrics, okay? But the reason that song bothers me so much is because what the lyrics seem to be implying is that the Lord has no, that God has no idea of the struggles we face in our daily lives. Am I right? The actual songwriter did not chose to not explain the song. She decided that she wanted to leave the song open to interpretation, to the interpretation of the listener. So at face value, that's what the words are saying, that God is not close to us. God is watching us from where? A distance, right? And from his perspective, everything looks just fine. You know, there's harmony on the earth, a nice, beautiful blue earth, right? As you see the picture from satellites in space sometimes, or the astronauts. That's the song that really gets on my nerves. It really, really bothers me because the God I know is not a God far, far away who has no clue of our everyday. Is that right? That's right. In fact, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Right? So the Bible is telling us, and who is the high priest? Jesus, right? The Bible is telling us that Jesus understands our troubles. He understands not just our troubles, but he also understands our weaknesses. He understands the things that we have difficulty dealing with the temptations that we face that are sometimes so hard to break. The Bible clearly says that, that we don't have a high priest who has no clue what's going on in our lives, right? We look back, I keep reminding us of that, that, that ecclesiastical system of the Middle Ages. You know, the, the priests were untouchable. You couldn't get near them, right? But they wanted stuff from the people all the time. But getting close to God was impossible unless you went to the priest. So the priest in that system stood as God's representative, but it wasn't a love relationship. It was do this, do this, or you're not going to be saved. But the Bible paints a very different picture of Jesus, that it's Jesus who is our high priest. And not just, not, he's not just our high priest, he's a high priest who knows what we face in life. I know I've been getting pretty animated. Tonight I may not be quite as, a, as animated because I want to deal with a subject that I believe is so integral to our, our lives. Um, I want to start by looking at the temptations of Jesus, okay? So we're going to go there right now. We're going to go to uh, the book of Luke in chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible says this, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to be what? to be bread. What was the temp this temptation about, this one? Seems to be about appetite, right? If you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Yes, the issue was appetite, but there was another issue going on here too, because did Jesus have the power to turn the stones into bread? He sure did. So the, the issue wasn't, even, wasn't only appetite, 
but was how he was going to use his power, correct? Now, I believe science tells us that at 40 days, that is probably the maximum you can go without food. So basically, scientifically speaking, Jesus was, was almost at the point of death, right? He chose this, okay? Sometimes we may wonder, why did he choose to do that? Well, remember, Jesus came to save us, right? Jesus came to do what we could never do. So Jesus had to be very disciplined. He had to exercise self-control, right? So the Bible says that the Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted. But Jesus uh, chose in the wilderness to not eat for 40 days. He chose to exercise a self-control that, praise the Lord, we probably will never be asked to exercise, right? 40 days. So Jesus was at the brink of death when the devil came and said, turn the stones into bread if what? If you're the son of God, right? So yes, this was an issue of appetite because bread, I'm sure at that point, sounded really, really good. So, but it wasn't just appetite. Jesus had the power to actually make the stones bread, right? Okay, what does it say in verse 11? Jesus responds by saying this, or it says, then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. I threw this verse in here. This is actually from uh, Matthew, because this verse proves that Jesus did not actually make the stones bread, okay? So the devil wanted him to make the stones bread, but we find that Matthew adds this little detail that after the temptation of hunger, the angels came and ministered to them. In other words, Jesus didn't satisfy his own needs. Am I right? That's right. That's why the angels had to come and they had to minister to Jesus after he was tempted by, tempted by the devil. Let's look at the next temptation, going back to Luke. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, okay? So Jesus successfully resists this first temptation. And then what does the, what does the devil do? The Bible says, our next verse, but the devil, then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours, right? Okay, so what is this temptation about? Hmm? It seems to be about power, correct? If you want all the kingdoms of the world, I'll give them to you. It seems to be about power, so that may have been one component, for, but for Jesus, it obviously wasn't a power thing, because when we look at the life of Jesus, he certainly was not on a power trip, right? Never used his divine power to satisfy himself, Every special, every miracle act that Jesus did was always for someone else. Not once did he do any miracle for himself. So this certainly wasn't a temptation of power for Jesus. But what was Jesus' purpose in coming to this earth, right? To turn the eyes of the nations to the plan of salvation, right? That all men might be saved. So in the devil's mind, he tempts Jesus with this whole thing, thinking that if Jesus could think that he could shortcut his mission, right? By just the devil giving him all the, all the nations of the world, Jesus wouldn't have to go to the cross, correct? That's what's in the devil's mind. Isn't it interesting, too, that the devil chooses to assume that he owns the whole world, right? He said right there in the verse that it's all been delivered to me. By who? God? No. Why did the devil assume that all the kingdoms of the earth have been delivered to him? Because of people, right? Because throughout history, the majority of people naturally followed him as opposed to following God, right? So by default and by the decisions and actions of men and kingdoms and powers and bloodshed and everything else, the devil clearly assumed leadership of this world. And so that's why the devil comes along and says, this is my world, and I'll give it to you if you will merely bow down and worship me. So this was an issue, not so much of power, but of worship, right? That's right. How many people have, have sold their soul, quote unquote, to the, to the devil, right? Music history is littered with people who have, quote unquote, sold their soul to the devil. I'll mention one because that person mentioned it themselves wide out in the open. Jimmy Page, guitarist for Led Zeppelin, right? Of the 1970s said he sold his soul to the devil. He made a pact with the enemy, with the devil, and the devil gave him his power to play as he did you know, in, in the way that he did to, to gain such a massive following of the group Led Zeppelin. So I mentioned his name specifically. I made the mistake of mentioning a name the other night. I try not to mention 
you know, the names of specific people because by God's, by the chance, where they actually hear one of these presentations, you know, we don't want to offend people. I don't think they would want to join the church we're sitting there talking about them. But I mentioned his name because he was very out in the open about it. You know, he was actually very proud of that decision. But what did that cost him? Hmm? Did he live a great life? No, very miserable, miserable, miserable life. Maybe even the greatest guitarist in the world considered. But every person who has claimed to sell their soul to the devil has never come out ahead. And by the way, can you really sell your soul to the devil? No, because it's not yours to sell, right? It's not yours to sell because Jesus bought us with a price, right? The only person who owns our soul is, the de is Jesus because he shed his precious blood on the cross for you and me. So what is Jesus' response to the devil in this one? He says this. He says, And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Praise the Lord. Jesus overcame that one as well. And then the devil comes up with another idea. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, the city of God, right? This is Zion, Jerusalem, the, the city that Jesus came to save, his people. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from there. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands he shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Wow, now the devil's getting really sneaky, isn't he? Right? He didn't get Jesus on the first temptation, didn't get him on the second one, so now he figures... If I use scripture itself, maybe I can trick the Son of God, right? So, so sneak in. Even in the Garden of Eden, what did, the, what did the devil say? Did God really say this? Man, you know, he's always trying to get us, and that's why we have to be sharp as God's people, because, sharp as Christians, because the devil will not just use the big scary monsters to try to keep us in fear, right? And try to just steal our joy, but many times he will actually come, as the Bible says, as an angel of light. And he will actually try to confuse us with Scripture itself. This is why it's so important that we study the Word of God. So anyway, so this is his, this is his plan for Jesus at this point. I'm going to present Scripture, and Jesus may fall for it. What would have been the temptation in this situation here? Hmm? Have we ever heard the word presumption? Presumption. Big word, okay? It means to pre-assume, okay? And what would be the pre-assumption in this case? that God is going to protect us regardless of whatever decision we make, right? I remember I told you last night I had a motorcycle. Was it last night? Yeah, I told you I got a motorcycle in college. Well, I was still a growing Christian. I was a Christian, but I was still learning stuff. And I remember coming back from the beach one time on my motorcycle. It was just me. I was on the highway, and this is in Massachusetts. A four-lane highway, maybe five. I don't know, it was one of the widest highways I've seen, at least in the nor Northeast. Was it the 495, I think? 495. And... There's a long stretch of highway. I couldn't see a car in sight. So what did I do as any young boy would do without a very good sense of self-control? I opened up the throttle, got it going faster and faster, and I brought that motorcycle up to about 135 miles an hour. Okay? In fact, I'm sure it was 135 because I remember the guy I bought it from said that that was the fastest he had the motorcycle to. So I wanted to kind of go a little bit beyond that. So I'm doing 135 miles an hour. It wasn't very long. And I was so fast, and probably slow compared to what some guys do these days. It was so fast that the trees were literally almost like a blur. And I had my head tucked right down on top of the gas tank, you know, because the wind was, was so strong at that speed. And I'm flying along, and guess what I'm wearing? You know, full protective gear? Nope. I was wearing a t-shirt, a pair of shorts. I wasn't even wearing socks. I was wearing those, um, what do you call those, boat shoes? Those leather boat shoes, they're low, and you just kind of slip them in and out. I would have been... A really nice sight, right, had I crashed? Anyway, I'm flying along, and I hear this voice come into my head saying, what are you doing? And when I heard that voice, it was like a reality check. I was like, what am I doing? This is crazy. So I remember slowing down carefully, and I literally came to a complete, eventually to a complete stop, and I pulled over on the side of the highway. And it was the first time as a very young Christian I realized that was so presumptuous. That, that was the term that came to my mind pre-assuming that now that I'm a Christian and I know that God loves me and he wants to protect me, that I can make any choice I want, and because of his great love for me, he is going to protect me in any situation, right? Presumption. That was the temptation for Christ, right? To throw himself off of the building. The devil wanted proof, correct? He wanted to throw himself off of the building because, don't forget Jesus, the Lord promised that if you dash your foot against the stone, well, the angels will grab you before you dash your, your foot against the stone. So that was the third temptation, right? And what did Jesus respond by saying? Oh, did we miss that last verse? Okay. No, 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 the one before that. Okay, it's okay. 
Nevertheless, Jesus did not give in to the devil. Praise the Lord, right? Okay. What were, the, what were the issues of the temptation about? Seems like it was about appetite. It was about power and shortcutting the, the plan of salvation. And then the third one was definitely presumption. Is that my right? Okay. That's what it appears like on the surface. But you know what the real issue was? The real issue was identity. It was identity. Do you remember what happened right before Jesus went into the wilderness? Remember we keep talking about context? We have to understand scripture in the greater context. Right before Jesus went into the wilderness, he was baptized by John in the River Jordan, right? And what happened when Jesus came up out of the water? The Lord spoke, God spoke from heaven, right? This is what? My beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And immediately the spirit drives him into the wilderness. And what does the devil say the first thing he says? If you're the son of God, right? The issues and the temptation in the wilderness really had much more to do with identity than it had to do with the other surface issues that we see. It was about identity. It was about attacking the identity of Jesus and putting Jesus in a position where he knew he couldn't prove himself. Because it was, first of all, it would have been against what God had established in Scripture. Secondly, it would have been to, to prove something to the devil. Don't ever waste your time trying to prove something to the devil, okay? He, you, you hear his voice, figuratively speaking, you know? Don't waste your time. If you literally hear his voice, don't respond, okay? There's a lot of people in the world who hear voices, and sometimes I deal with church members who tell me they hear voices and say, don't talk back, okay? Jesus never wasted a lot of time talking to the demons, did he? That's right, because we don't get anywhere doing that. In fact, sometimes we give the devil a foothold by, um, by doing what we call parleying with the enemy. So the issue of the third temptation was, was um, presumption. We can actually skip Psalm 90, verse 12. I was going to give you a text for that, but that's okay. The reason I mention these things today is because identity is actually at the central core of our being, is it not? Isn't identity at our very core? It is. The, the reason we have hope in life, the reason we actually continue to exist is because we need a sense of identity. Am I right? Without a sense of identity, we just kind of feel lost. Isn't that true? Without a sense of identity, we feel lost. We don't know who we are, and we don't know where we belong. We don't know why we're here, and we don't know who we belong to. Identity is actually so critical. It's such an integral component of our being that we can't even divorce ourselves from it because the reason we exist is because of identity, all right? And many times, people have the actually, not a, a missing sense of identity, but many people have the wrong sense of identity. In other words, many of us grew up in homes where maybe we were literally called worthless, right? Or maybe we grew up in homes where our parents ignored us and we felt worthless. We felt insignificant, right? Many of us grew up in, in uh, schools where we were picked on. And maybe we were, we were picked on so much that that became our, our perspective of ourselves. That became our identity. And because of being afraid to say anything to mom and dad about it, for fear of getting in, in bigger trouble with the person picking on us, we internalize it. Am I right? And that becomes our identity. And so the problem is sometimes we, we grow up with either no sense of identity because we're disconnected from families and things like that, or we have a very negative identity, images and ideas that have been placed in our heads by our social surroundings. This issue of identity is actually so critical to us as Christians. And I find it very, very, very interesting that, do you know in the early 1800s, there was what was called a great religious awakening, both in Europe and in the United States uh, in, of America. In 1798, the Pope was taken captive by General Berthier, right? Of the French armies, the French Revolution. He was taken captive, correct? Well, after some time, this created a great interest in the scriptures and the prophecies. And what happened was, across the globe in Europe and in America, there became what was called a great religious awakening. People wanted to know truth. Because what happened to, to the Roman Catholic system was such a shock that people were wanted to know what was going on. They wanted to understand what the Bible taught about this. This was no little tiny event in the corner. This was very, very significant. You know what is so fascinating? Is that around the same time, while this religious awakening was, was uh, developing, who um, came out with a very, very interesting book called Origin of the Species? Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was born right here in England. Am I correct? Right. And Charles Darwin's um, skew on reality was that, no, we did not come from God. We were not created. We were the result of 
the survival of the fittest, but you go far enough back and we end up, it was just a, we came from some primordial soup, right? Isn't it an interesting timing that at, that at a place and a time in the world when the greatest interest in the Bible was occurring, that the greatest attack on identity was occurring as well, right? Because the result of that book, Survival or The Origin of the Species, stripped people away of what I would call a God consciousness, right? Because up until that point, people, it was almost the default mindset of everybody that there was a God, okay? Until this comes along and all of a sudden people start reassessing stuff. It also was around the time of the great um, enlightenment, right? The age of enlightenment. We talked a little bit about that the other day. Uh, industrialization, right? The, the impact of progressive science. All of a sudden, God is now divorced even more from the minds of people. We don't need God anymore. Science can explain it all. Do you find the timing very interesting? It's very interesting. In fact, you should study it because the more you study it, you find how the enemy is always trying to attack our identity. Romans chapter 6, verse 5 says this. Mm, we uh, have Romans chapter 6, 5. Do you have that there? Okay, let me, uh, I'll turn there in scripture, it's okay. It's Romans chapter 6, 5. You can stay there and we'll come back to it if you don't have it. Romans chapter 6, verse 5 says this. This is a beautiful verse. It says, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, what is it talking about? Baptism, right? Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, right? What is this verse saying? And it's saying a whole lot. And a lot of different studies can come from this. But the verse really, in its essence, is saying this. When we've been baptized into a new relationship with Jesus, the old man, what? Is done away with, right? And that old man can be an old man or old woman, right? In the past, with a very, very bad sense of personal identity, a no sense of identity, right? So the beauty of a baptized new walk with Jesus is the fact that we get a new identity, right? Because it says we shall be raised in newness of life with him. Isn't that a beautiful thought? And the devil doesn't like this because the devil does not want us to have a healthy sense of identity. I remember at the age of 14 after my friend died, uh, I'm not going to go into all that right now, very traumatic for a 14-year-old, and I struggled in school. And so what I did, I went to some psychologists, right, to try to help me figure out what was going on and maybe get some, some bearing uh, with my life. And so, of course, what, what they did was they, trying to help me get back on track in school and get focused, they kept telling me to look within myself to the, my sense of identity, right? They kept trying to get me to look deeper and deeper into myself and find the positive things in my life that would help me get a stronger sense of my personal identity so that I could face the issues that I was facing that I wasn't, it wasn't because I, I was special because God loved me, it was because I was special in and of myself for my own specialness. But here was the problem with that. The more I looked into myself, the more I realized how consist, inconsistent I was, right? If I was a, had a perfect track record, I could look into myself and say, that's right, you know? I've made great decisions in my life. I'm very successful. I've been doing great. Of course, I'm just going to, you know, clench my fist and I need to just have this attitude right on out. But that's not usually the track record of all of us, is it? We've all made mistakes in the past. So the deeper I looked into myself, I didn't find any help at all. And so she said, well, think about the people who love you. You know, think about your friends, think about your families. And that was a good start too. But then as I thought about my friends and family, I realized, hey, they're very inconsistent as well. Mom and dad were fighting at home, right? They, they certainly loved me. I mean, I had a sense of love in the home, but there was a lot of turmoil in their relationship. There was struggles, there was pain. My friends were very inconsistent, you know? One day your friend, next day not. My Goodness, I mean, talk about relationships early on in life. In, in middle school, high school, very inconsistent, right? Everything's going great one day, the next day, terrible. Break up, right? Next girlfriend, break up. Next girlfriend. So when I looked at myself, I didn't see consistency. When I looked at other people, I didn't see consistency. It's hard to formulate a sense of identity from people or from ourselves. Because by, in, by our inherent nature, we are very, very inconsistent people, and other people are very, very inconsistent as well. So this is what I did, because identity is so central to our lives. We live, we crave, we need a sense of identity. So when I was 13 years old, I told you I was really into skateboarding. Well, I was so much into it that I would study everything about skateboarding. I, I wanted to become a professional skateboarder, and I was very good at it. I was very good at skateboarding. That's why I was able to do competitions and stuff. That became my identity. 
okay? My skateboard was either in my hand or in my car. If I was going to work, it was in my car, so that as soon as work was done, I was back on my skateboard, skating and doing tricks and everything else. I would sleep thinking about skateboarding. I would wake up, think about skateboarding. Every free moment I had was thinking about where can we go skating next. I had friends that were skateboarders. That was my identity. It was so much my identity that when I was not with my skateboard, I felt lost. No, really, I, I felt lost. So if I, if I was meeting a crowd of new people, without my skateboard, I didn't know who I was, right? Because I didn't have something positive to identify myself with. I didn't have my identity, you follow me? So after I, my skateboarding years, I, I was very good in art in, in high school, I won a scholarship and stuff, and so when I started getting into the partying scene, I shared that with my testimony, I wasn't skateboarding as much. What I used to do is I would go around to parties with my portfolio of all the drawings that I had done. I won a scholarship to the Woodstock School of Art, and, and I, I kind of did things in a Salvador Dali fashion, you know, uh, surreal and things like that. So I'd go to parties, and the people who were on drugs would say, hey, man, did you bring your portfolio? And I'd open up my drawings, and they'd sit there, and they'd, you know, just stare at my drawings <laughs> all night long. That was my sense of identity. Without my portfolio, I didn't know who I was. I'm being very honest with you. My identity was either in something that I was good at or something that or some person that was good with me. So when it wasn't my portfolio, if it wasn't my skateboard, it was my girlfriend. And when I didn't have a girlfriend and I didn't have those things connected, I didn't know who I was, right? Identity is so, so critical. And then it was music. Music, the same thing. I'm a punk rocker, right? And I'm this person because I like this kind of music. You know, people find identity in jobs. People find identity in cars. People find identity in in their possessions. Women often find identity in their husbands. Am I right? Right, because it's very important for a woman to feel protected, cared for, and nurtured. So many women rush into marriage, not all, but many rush into marriage because they're craving that identity. And that male figure gives them that sense of identity until the relationship turns sour and they realize that, that the male person, their husband, is just as faulty and flawed as they are. And then things can really go awry. And when the relationship breaks up, many women often lose their sense of identity, and they do what is called a rebound relationship, right? It's the same thing for the men, too. Without another person, many men are very lost, you know? If they don't have a girlfriend, if they don't have a girl, if they don't not marry, they're very lost, very, very unsure of themselves. And so we naturally are always craving identity in a position, our possessions, in our abilities, and in people. But the problem is, is that Everywhere we look, we find that things are just inconsistent, right? I like your car. You showed me last, last night, right? But your car has problems sometimes, right? Naturally, okay? I've had nice cars, but every car has problems. So it's great driving around in a nice-looking car, but someday that car is going to break down. So if our identity is wrapped up in the things that we have, the day that those things break down, we have what? We need to re-anchor ourselves and figure out where identity is. When I look at the life of Christ, his identity was dogged every waking moment he had. Do you know that the identity of Christ was harassed from the beginning of his ministry to the end? Remember what happened in the, uh, after he cleansed the temple? He went into the church and he found out that everybody's selling all the goats and the sheep and everything else. It's loud. It's, it's, nobody's worshiping God. It's a complete mess. It's like a marketplace, right? So he makes a whip of cords. He doesn't hit anybody, but he chases people out. And then the Pharisees hear about it and they run around the corner and they say, what miracle can you do to prove you have the right to do this, right? What they're really saying to Jesus was, you've got no right to do this because you're just a man. His identity being attacked right there. You remember when he said, um, Abraham rejoiced to see my day? And everybody's like, what are you talking about? You're not even 50 years old. They all laughed at him, right? You're not even 50 years old. How could you possibly have seen Abraham? They're attacking his identity. Now, they, they didn't consciously do that, but the devil was doing that through them. What happens when he healed the, the, um, the demon-possessed men? Beautiful thing. A lot of the people were rejoicing because that person was freed of being possessed of a demon. But what did, the, what did many other people say? Oh, he sets free demons by the prince of demons, right? An attack on his identity. Every step Jesus made, his identity was attacked nonstop. Other occasions, he was accused that Jesus himself had a demon. When, um, when the man in John chapter 9 was born blind, uh, the disciples were walking by and they saw the man blind on the side of the street, they said, who sinned, this man or his parents? Jesus said, that's not the point. 
The point is that so God can do a work of a miracle here. And so you know the story. Jesus heals the man. And then the Pharisees find out. And when the, once the man is healed, they drag him into the, into the temple. And they start accusing the man and asking him, how did you get healed? Well, the man explains everything. And then finally the Pharisees get so tired of hearing the man because he's giving glory to God. They say, this man is a sinner. Right? Jesus' identity was attacked from the beginning of his ministry right to the end. But Jesus didn't, shake it, didn't get shaken. Why? Because Jesus knew who his father was. In fact, in John chapter 8, verse 19, what did Jesus say? Then they said to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. In other words, I am so close to the father that if you knew me, you would have known my father. The only reason Jesus was able to hold on to his identity was because of his close walk with the father. I mean, can you, have, has anybody in here ever had their identity attacked? Have you ever been accused of something you've never done? Slander, right? You don't have to raise your hand and share. But many of us have been in positions like that before. Pastors, forget it. <laughs> you know? Not everybody's going to be happy with a pastor. And sometimes the, peop, the, the saints will say things that are not even really true about the pastor. And so the pastor often deals with accusations that are not even true. They're not even founded. Okay? So many of us in here either at work or at home, you know, in a relationship gone bad, get accused of things that we are not guilty of. So our identity is tacked. And it never feels good when our identity is tacked, is it? Eric Erickson was um, best known for his famous theory of psychosocial development. Eric Erickson was the guy who um, came up with the term, coined the term identity crisis. Everybody know what that is? Sure. It's when you get to a point in life where you, where you suddenly have an identity crisis. Or you've lost your bearings. You don't know who you are. You, you, you've lost your footing, you know, and you have to rethink and reassess everything that you've learned, everything that you know, because you've lost a sense of who you are. You've lost a sense of who the world is around you, and you've lost a sense of who you are, and it becomes an identity crisis. And this is a major, major problem sometimes for people when they go through that. Um, I think men go through it, women go through it. We all go through it at times. He said that he agreed, as did many other psychologists, that love and acceptance... Well, first he said this. He said that, that psychosocial, his, in his psychosocial theory, he looked at how social influences contribute to personality throughout the entire lifespan. What kind of influences? Psychosocial. In other words, social settings, right? Very much shape who we are and the identity that we internalize ourselves. But he, he understood one thing above all else. He said love and acceptance is the most powerful foundation for identity. Isn't that beautiful? Is it, would you agree that love and acceptance is the most powerful foundation of identity? It sure is, because any child that is loved and nurtured and cared for, most children, whether they're the brightest bulbs in the tree or not, will grow up to be solid citizens. True? Simply because they had a strong sense of identity. They had something to reference themselves with. It's a beautiful thing because, you know what? God reminds us over and over and over again in Scripture, I have loved you with an everlasting love. In Jeremiah, he says, therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. I don't believe there's anything more powerful to a sense of identity than just knowing that we are beloved of God. Knowing that he loved us so much in John chapter 3.16 that he sent his only begotten son for us. What greater reference point for identity than that? People are unpredictable. Jobs are unpredictable. You know, of the 1,270 odd days of Jesus' public ministry, there was probably only a handful of days where he actually had rest and peace. In fact, Jesus' pl favorite place to go to was to the home of Mary, Lazarus, Lazarus and Martha. Because when you read the, the writing, the, the spirit of prophecy, you know, she says that that was the only home where Jesus felt accepted. It was the only home where Jesus felt that he was believed for what he actually was. It was the only home where he could rest and not be harassed by the people who were hunting his life. Jesus had a favorite circle of friends. Isn't that a beautiful thought? And guess what? He calls us friends. Isn't that a beautiful thought too? No longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. We can make our home a place where Jesus is happy to be. That's a beautiful thought. That's a little off topic. But, but anyway, getting back to this, of, of this whole ministry, the one thing he was hounded for constantly was his sense of identity. How much credit do you give people who have a particular image of who you are? 
Hmm? It's interesting that, you know, I believe studies prove that, that we tend to give the people who have a negative view of us far more credit than we should give the people who are trying to encourage us. It just seems to be human nature that when something negative is said about us, we tend to internalize that much quicker than, than when someone speaks words of life. You know, the Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue. Isn't that true? When someone gives you an encouraging word and says, I love you, sister, you know, you just, every time you smile, it just makes me feel good. That's encouraging. Don't you feel good about that? Absolutely. If someone were to say, you know what, when I look at you, I, I, want, to, I want my walk with Jesus to be like that. Not that the person wants to be like you, but what they see is, is, a, is a committed life to the Savior, a life that has changed. And when you hear that, it's inspiring, right? It makes you want to follow Jesus even more because you realize you're helping people change lives. You're influencing people. You're, you're encouraging people to, to reconsider their walk with God, how shallow it is or how deep it is. But the truth is we tend to internalize negativity far more than we do the positive. I believe God wants us to cast off the negative. Isn't that right? And put on the positive. And we can be a positive influence with each other. Anne Villaquay, she was a professor at the University of Arkansas, she said this. She said, we're living in this world that's so fragmented and so chaotic. We continue to be struck by ra rapid and unpredictable change. She, she did a co-author study with Jeff Murray and said at the time, the result is a loss of personal anchors needed for identity. You know what she's saying? She did this huge study, and she's looking at society, and she says people are losing their sense of identity because of what is called, what she called, termed personal anchors. And a part of that study, she was looking at the tattoo phenomenon. Have you ever noticed there's more and more people getting tattoos over the past 10 years? Everywhere you turn, right? Tattoos used to be something taboo. If you had tattoos, you were either part of a motorcycle gang, you're part of the underground crowd, right? Not anymore. Now you go into the mall, and you see it's glamorized, right? And I'm not, I'm not, you know, this is not a thing if you have tattoos. This isn't like, you know, shame on you, you're lost. Nothing like that. The point is society is shifting. People are losing their anchor points. They're losing their sense of identity. And so that's why when we see these crazy trends going out through society, it's much, it's much deeper than just a fad. People are losing their sense of identity. And so she was looking at the tattoo phenomenon, and she realizes that people are getting tattoos because when they put a tattoo on, it, it, is, a, it is a memory reference point, okay? Mom with the little, you know, the arrow. Of course, now the, now the days are much darker, right? All kinds of crazy designs and everything else. But she says that's why people are getting tattoos more and more and more, because they're losing their sense of identity, and they need to be reminded of who they are. I believe in God's word reminds us of who we are. Right here in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. This hope we have as what? An anchor of the soul, both what? sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. This verse, we could unpack it all night long. Simply put, though, the Bible says it is our hope of our salvation in Jesus that is our anchor. Okay? There is no stronger anchor than the anchor we have in our relationship with Jesus because that is where our true identity is found. It's not found in how good we look, how we dress. It's not found in what our, our bank account numbers look like. It's not found in our cat and our dog. It's not found in, you know, it's not found in our wardrobe or anything else. Our true identity is found in the fact that Jesus loves us so much. And that's an identity that nobody can take away. You know, the disciples, as I finish up, the disciples went through an identity crisis, at least on two occasions. But the primary occasion was when Jesus started to let them know that he had to go to the cross. Imagine yourself being the disciples. It's, it's, in particular, James, Peter, James, and John. I mean, these guys were professional fishermen, right? Jesus comes along. He asks them to, to cast the net on the wrong side of the boat, on the, wrong, on the wrong part of the day, and they pull in a massive catch of fish, right? Complete miracle. They're so impressed that after that, Jesus says, no longer are you going to be fishers of fish, you're going to be fishers of men. And they leave their entire business. We're talking an established business on the Sea of Galilee that had been established probably in, for generations, because that's how it worked back in that, those days, right? Passed down the Father's business. They left everything for Jesus. In other words, their new identity was found in Jesus, right? And they walked with Jesus for three years. And when Jesus started saying, in a little while, I have to go to the cross and, and suffer and die, you know what it did to them? It shattered them. They lost their complete sense of identity. What? 
Our whole lives have been committed to you, Jesus, and you're going to go to the cross and die? But God is so good, he doesn't leave us without hope, does he? Look what happened in uh, Luke chapter 9, 28. Now it came to pass about the eight days after these sayings, eight days, sorry, I said six, that he took Peter, James, and John and went up on a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, appearance of Jesus' face, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, uh, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Wow, what an encouragement, right? Jesus has just told you that he's going to die. But the Lord knows how, I, how important identity is, identity is. So Jesus brings Peter, James, and John, the ones who were worried the most, and he gets glorified before their face, right? A vision of Christ in his glory with Moses and Elijah, the two greatest figures of the whole entire Bible, and God the Father reminds them, don't worry. Your identity is safe, right? Praise the Lord. So what happened next? Luke chapter 9, verse 45. This is right after Peter says, this is so great that we're here. Let's build a church. You know, we always want to get comfortable. Anytime something good happens, let's build a temple. So, so Peter, the outspoken one, Peter wanted to stop everything that they were doing and just say, Jesus, you're not going to the cross. This is so good. Let's just stop right here. Let's end the story right now. But that's when a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. There was only twice in scripture where God affirmed Jesus as his beloved son. It was right after he was baptized and then got driven into the wilderness where his identity was attacked. And it was here on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And what is Luke chapter 9, verse 28? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, yeah, that's where I was going to go. What about Job? I mean, think about Job. Job was the richest man on all the earth, right? He had a family, a big family, and he lost everything. The Lord allowed the devil to strip Job. Okay, The Lord didn't strip Job. He allowed the devil to prove his point. Because the, the devil's accusation was that Job only loved God for everything that he had. So the Lord allowed this great controversy to be played out in Job's life. And everything was stripped away from him. What did Job say in the end? He said, though my flesh be destroyed, in the end, I shall see God. Right? In other words, everything can be stripped away from us. Our life can be a complete mess, a complete turmoil, and yet we still can have a very strong sense of identity, that we're loved by God. You know, identity really is everything. And love is everything. If God didn't love us, where would we find our identity? But that's not the truth, is it, friends? God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. You know, our, our little Ian, uh, for a few of you who are new tonight, we have a seven-year-old boy, Ian. Ian has a little stuffed animal that he got when he was three, two, probably two. He's had this stuffed animal for, animal for about four years. Ian will not go anywhere it's a little stuffed, uh, it's a pillow pet. You know little pillow pets? It's like a pillow you can sleep on, but it's, got, it's like shaped like an animal. It's a little dog, but it's like bright blue, and I think it has yellow feet and a yellow face. <laughs> anyway, he named it Dodo for dog, okay? He will not go anywhere without Dodo. He brings that Dodo everywhere, and it's been four years. Dodo's been through the wash probably six, seven, eight times, you know, because he just brings him everywhere, you know? Hey, Ian, we're going to go to, you know, we're going to go to the lake today. Oh, let me get Dodo. You know, Ian, we're going to, we got to go to the church today. Can I bring Dodo? So Ian will, will not separate himself from Dodo. But after four years, Dodo's starting to look a little worn out. Doesn't bother Ian because that's his Dodo, right? The true thing about identity is this. Some things are loved because they have great value, Right? And other things have great value because they are greatly loved. You hear me? Some things we love because they have great value. But then there's some things that are of great value because they're greatly loved. You are the Lord's purchased possession. Our greatest sense of identity isn't how we make ourselves look. It isn't how we walk. It isn't how many friends we have. It isn't even how many victories we have had in our life. And it's certainly not how many failures we have had in our life. 
The fact that we are so valuable is merely because Jesus loves us so much. So is it worth giving our lives to him? Is it worth it? Nobody loves us quite like Jesus. Not even mom and dad if you grew up in a loving home. Does anybody want to give their life to Jesus tonight? Don't you want to get rid of the old identity? Jesus said, come unto me, all ye labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Why do we drag around our past identity when Jesus holds a brand new one out for us? If you want to give your heart to Jesus, just fully, please stand. Please stand. This isn't a call for baptism. This is just a call to recommit our lives to the Savior because we're so loved. And without him, we really wouldn't have a sense of identity. If that is your decision tonight, just want to give all to Jesus. Why don't you just stand to your feet? The the Savior sees you standing. And if you're not standing, it's okay. He loves you just the same. By standing, you're not admitting that you're in the middle of doing anything wrong. You're just saying, I love Jesus so much because he's loved me so much. And I have made a decision that every day of my life, regardless of whether I feel good or whether I feel bad, I'm going to remember where my true identity is found. Amen. God sees every one of you. Lord bless you as we close tonight.